Good afternoon. I'm Marie Bernard, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging, and it's with great pleasure on behalf of the Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers and the Special Populations Research Forum that I introduce to you Dr. Jennifer Manley. Dr. Manley is Associate Professor of Neuropsychology and Neurology at the G.H. Churgivsky Center and the Taub Institute for Research and Aging at Columbia University. Uh, she did her graduate training in neuropsychology at San Diego State University, a clinical internship at Brown University, and a postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia University. Her work is on early life determinants of cognitive aging and social and biological risk for cognitive impairments among racially, racially and ethnically diverse middle-aged and older adults. She's a highly funded researcher from the National Institute on Aging and the Alzheimer's Association, widely published and highly recognized with multiple leadership roles in the American Psychological Association and recognition by them. She's the past chair of the National Alzheimer's Project Act, Project Act Advisory Committee, uh, Research Com Committee, uh, having worked very closely with Richard Hodes, our director, and uh, multiple other researchers in fashioning the research plan uh, for Alzheimer's research under NAPA, and a current member of the Alzheimer's Association Medical and Scientific Research Board. I could go on. Um, she's been in the field for a bit of time. Um, but rather than take away from her presentation, I would like to present to you Dr. Manley. Thank you very much for that introduction. It really is uh, an amazing honor to be here. Uh, when you get to do this lecture, you get to spend the whole day here and um, meet with people who um, have shaped your career and influenced your uh, trajectory. And that really is true of, for me, of the program staff at NIA. So I really want to thank everyone. Um, and you know who you are in the audience and also um, uh, on the web. Uh, from the very beginning, you've been advocates for, for me and my research, and um, I, I want to really honor you uh, in, in uh, as much as, an, as it is an honor for me, it should be an honor for you uh, in, in uh, uh, me being able to, to show you some of the research that we're doing today. Here are some of the collaborators that I'm lucky to work with uh, in my work, and I'll be showing you um, many of uh, the research that's resulted from those collaborations and the grants in the past, and uh, some of them in the past, and some of them in the present that are supporting this work. What I'd like to do this afternoon is show you some evidence for disparities in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease in the United States, and then discuss some of the challenges, but also opportunities for disparities research in Alzheimer's disease um, that we have, we have faced and have allowed for um, new insights into this area of research. I will discuss some of our work in trying to determine what might be mediating racial and ethnic disparities in Alzheimer's disease and cognitive aging, and then I'll talk about some directions for the future. And this is uh, Washington Heights, the neighborhood of Washington Heights, where uh, I started off with this research topic. Um, I've been doing um, my, my research in, the, in Washington Heights for all those years that Marie mentioned, and it's a really diverse neighborhood. If you've ever been there, um, you don't need to speak English to get around. In fact, it's much better if you are a fluent Spanish speaker. Uh, and there's a lot of immigrant groups there, uh, a lot of diverse Latino immigrants, especially from the Caribbean, but also a cohort of African Americans who were primarily born and raised in the South. And even those people who describe themselves as non-Hispanic and white are extremely diverse. Many of them um, are uh, primarily uh, in their home. They speak Hungarian, Polish, German. Uh, again, immigrants uh, from the uh, World War II. And so uh, it's just an incredible place to do research um, on aging and uh, an incredible place to ask 
questions about how culture uh, affects the cognitive aging process. So uh, from the beginning, um, the uh, first cohort in the Washington Heights Inwood Columbia Aging Project was collected in 1992, and the PI of that study is Richard Mayu. And uh, over the course of three different cohorts, one in 92, one in 99, and the last one in 2009, uh, we've evaluated over 6,500 um, older adults who were selected for eligibility for the study because they were Medicare eligible, lived in the census tracts around the Columbia University Medical Center in northern Manhattan, uh, age 65 and older, and we required that um, they be fluent in either Spanish or English. We see them at baseline uh, and also eight, uh, every 18 to 24 months. Home visits is a big part of our research. We wouldn't have been able to do this uh, uh, research without offering home visits. If we asked people to come into the hospital, um, we'd be biasing our sample right from the get-go. Um, and uh, we administer a comprehensive neuropsychological test battery, medical and functional interview that seems a lot like, looks a lot like what um, the traditional workup um, uh, that's included in the National Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Coordinating Centers as a, as a uniform data set. Um, so you're, you're getting a workup at home that's very, very similar to uh, what, what you would get at an Alzheimer's disease center. Uh, and this is a very diverse neighborhood. Uh, the cohort is reflective of the neighborhood. Uh, about uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent are describe themselves as Hispanic or Latino. 30 percent are non-Hispanic and black. And uh, 20 to 25 percent are non-Hispanic and white. And one of the key findings of that study is that uh, among people who are baseline who were judged to be not demented based on our uh, evaluation, uh, following them over time, the average follow-up for this incident study is five years, that African Americans and Caribbean Hispanics are at a uh, significantly higher risk of developing incident Alzheimer's disease than our, our whites. So two important things to know is that this difference is resistant to adjustment for cardiovascular disease or a reported history of clinical stroke. And also, uh, when you adjust for years of school, where there are significant differences in years of education across those groups, this uh, 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 difference in incidence or incidence risk uh, disparity is uh, remains significant. So the factors that socioeconomic, income, occupational, uh, educational factors uh, don't um, uh, uh, explain this difference and cardiovascular factors do not explain this difference. We um, may have uh, published the, or, or one of the first groups to publish those data but um, many other groups have since found it, primarily those who are doing uh, community-based uh, uh, cohorts or representative cohorts, uh, national cohorts, and the Health and Retirement Study is one of them. These are not incidence data, they're prevalent data, but they found that um, cognitive impairment was um, uh, more prevalent or frequent among African Americans and Hispanics than among whites at all, in all of the age groups shown. And uh, more recently, and I think uh, uh, comprehensively, uh, Elizabeth Rose Maeda did an analysis of the Kaiser Permanente Northern California um, health system, found that Asian Americans were at lowest risk for developing incident dementia, and that African Americans uh, were at highest risk for developing incident dementia. Um, the the uh, nice thing about this study is that they had sufficient numbers of people in many different ethnic and racial groups, so they were able to compare um, among people who were all members of this Kaiser uh, health system. 
Um, they also um, adjusted for medical records, um, history of cerebrovascular, sorry, uh, cardiovascular disease, and found that that did not um, explain the differences in dementia uh, incidence across different um, ethnic groups. So there is a disparity, uh, and uh, you can find these disparities when you're doing uh, large epidemiologic cohorts. You can't find them when you uh, try to recruit from an Alzheimer's disease clinic because um, there is a tremendous selection bias in who shows up to that clinic. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, there's also a geographic overlay um, to, the, to, this, uh, dementia, uh, uh, to these dementia disparities. And uh, Maria Gleemore used uh, CDC data to find that there was excessive uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia mortality in the stroke belt for blacks who are on the left side of the, of the, of the, gra of the figure and whites who are on the right side of the figure. Um, and so there's something, um, there's something about race, but there's also something about geography uh, that uh, gives a, a pattern to the how dementia, how many people have dementia and die of dementia in the United States. So these disparities have uh, a real cost. Uh, we know from the, the study in Washington Heights that in general, dementia is an underdiagnosed disease that about half um, over in, in the United States, half of the people who have dementia have not received a formal diagnosis, but that is um, true of about 80% of the ethnic minorities uh, in the Washington Heights area who have dementia have not been formally diagnosed by a physician. And when they do come into the clinic, um, they are in later stages of the, di of, of the disease. Um, more cognitively and functionally impaired than, than whites who present, and that translates into higher costs uh, in terms of Medicare payments and uh, higher prevalence of neuropsychiatric symptoms, which uh, cause a lot of burden for caregivers. <clears throat> so one of the first methodolo methodological challenges I'm going to talk about is selection bias. <clears throat> There are differences in recruitment across uh, these racial and ethnic and cultural groups that can lead to non-generalizable results. So uh, when a center decides, an Alzheimer's disease center decides that they uh, need to recruit uh, ethnic minorities from the surrounding area, they will undergo a number of outreach efforts that uh, may or may not succeed in getting more people to come into their research study, but the participants in that research using that kind of approach are really not representative of the community that they're meant to, to, uh, to represent. So if you're asking people, for example, to come into the clinic so that they can get an MRI, if, or if you're requiring that lumbar puncture be a part of your study, that is going to uh, significantly bias who's willing to do that. Um, uh, and how that's related to race makes a difference with respect to results. Um, racial and ethnic minorities are, in general, we know this, even though there's clearly, uh, using these uh, representative cohorts, a disparity in who is more likely to have cognitive impairment and dementia, they're less likely to present to memory disorders clinics. And so I think now is a good time to bring up um, the, uh, the danger of making um, uh, conclusions about uh, how biomarkers, for example, in Alzheimer's disease relate to uh, the clinical syndrome of Alzheimer's disease based on people who were largely recruited through these clinics. And that is um, uh, in the works because there's a research framework that NIA is collaborating with the Alzheimer's Association to develop. And the, uh, the data that's being used to support that research framework, which uh, 
uh, takes the clinical syndrome and um, puts it at a, uh, in a, in a backseat to the biomarkers, amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration that are uh, collected via lumbar puncture or neuroimaging, um, will be the basis of the research diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease according to uh, this research framework. And uh, there are, are hardly any ethnic minorities in the cohorts that have been used to develop uh, that, that framework. So I think this is a selection bias is a real danger to the conclusions that we can make about our research. The, one of the reasons why I think there is a bias in these types of studies is that there's a continuing mistrust of research and also a stigma associated with cognitive impairment and dementia in some of the communities that we're hoping to engage and involve. Um, and it's not just about Tuskegee. Um, uh, I, I heard that in, in some circles people may um, think that uh, you know, minority communities are overreacting to the Tuskegee incident. It was such a long time ago and we don't do things that way anymore. Well, even if that's true, people, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, and American Indians continue to experience every day uh, lack of cultural and linguistic competency in the healthcare system and so it's a, um, it, is, it is not um, something in the past the, the, the source of mistrust of research, it's here and now, and we are responsible for it. Um, there is an impact of those historical medical abuses in the community, but also um, as a neuropsychologist, I am aware of the um, particular uh, areas of research like use of IQ tests to support racist beliefs and racist policies about uh, racial um, uh, 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 superiority um, to, to uh, uh, that continue to have an impact on whether people are willing to take part in this kind of research. Um, there continue to be intractable disparities despite um, research in, in these communities and I think that makes people doubt whether research can really help them. Uh, and um, as I mentioned before, ongoing experiences of discrimination, little and big in the medical setting, um, including lack of access to information. So it's a, really a two-way street and I think we're responsible for a lot of the mistrust that's occurring. The other source of bias is a survival bias and Maria Gleemore and her colleagues have uh, talked very, or written very nicely about this, which is that by the time uh, older adults are around for me to study, um, they have lived longer uh, than many people would on average in their community and that is uh, related to uh, race and it is also related to something unmeasured. Um, that hardiness factor is usually some unobserved characteristic that may not have initially been related to, to race but once they get older is very much related to race. So that affects uh, the conclusions that I can make about the relationship between my predictors and my outcome, which is dementia. Um, survival bias is normally studied with, of course, res uh, with respect to mortality, but it can occur for any outcome that um, occurs just once, like dementia. So survival bias was a part in these results that Laura Zahadny and uh, uh, others looked at in two cohorts, the Midas cohort, the Midlife in the United States study, and the YCAP cohort, which I described earlier. These are cross-sectional data, and she looked at episodic memory performance, created a uh, harmonized Z-score uh, even though they were different measures of memory across both studies. She created a harmonized z-score across groups uh, or across studies and looked at the magnitude of the disparity across African Americans who are the dotted lines here and whites um, the solid line here. And you can see that that disparity narrows in the older group regardless of study. So 
uh, even in uh, Midas, where the younger group is less than 57 year, years old and the older group is 57 years and, and older, this survival bias reduces the magnitude of a disparity. It's still there, but it reduces that magnitude in the oldest old. So um, when, we, uh, when we're looking at the relationship between risk factors or even resilience factors and outcomes like cognition, we have to take into account that uh, this age of as lev leveler effect, it's there with socioeconomic status as well, but we just demonstrated it here um, with race. Now measurement, I actually, in my travels um, around today, got a number of questions about, well, if, if you're measuring cognition, aren't those tests biased across race? And are you sure you're measuring the same thing um, in terms of cognition or cognitive ability in African Americans, Hispanics, and whites. So one of the ways to look at that is with structural equation modeling, some of these more modern psychometric methods. Uh, in the YCAP cohort, we've looked at our battery. This is your first glimpse into some of the tests that we give, the selective reminding test. Uh, we have measures of language like naming and fluency, both phonemic and semantic. Uh, visual spatial tests, um, using pictures or having people draw pictures, and also a trail making test uh, that's more, um, um, that's less sensitive to literacy or uh, educational or cultural differences, it's called the color trails, um, it, as a measure of speed. The structure of this, um, of the, of this, um, the structure of these, this factor um, analysis is the same across language, across English and Spanish spe speakers. So the indicators of speed, for example, are similarly related to that latent factor score um, across English and Spanish speakers. And then the speed factor is similarly related to the other factors equally across language. The one thing that's not invariant across the two groups is that Spanish speakers obtain lower scores on the color trails test than do English speakers. So if you're going to use these tests cross-sectionally to dis determine if someone is impaired or not impaired, you need to use a, a normative adjustments, not just for years of education, but also for language and race. So, um, but this structural equation modeling is one way, uh, and invariance analysis is one way to determine if you are measuring the same thing across groups. Um, we also, in I just mentioned the norms, we created norms within YCAP on a robust group of people uh, who were not only um, not, dement not demented and not uh, functionally impaired at baseline, but also were uh, still functionally uh, independent at a follow-up visit. That's important because some norms for older adults have demented people in the normative cohort. They just are in that preclinical stage or that MCI stage. Um, so you want to have a robust group of norms where you have follow-up data that weeds out anybody who's in the preclinical stage. We did that. And when we did that, there were no significant differences uh, in rates of mild cognitive impairment <clears throat> across uh, groups, either with memory impairment or without memory impairment. So how does that um, add up? Because I just showed you the, the data where rates of dementia or Alzheimer's disease were higher in the, in the uh, African Americans and Hispanics. And so if you're asking that question, I want you to hold on to that thought carefully. Um, one of the issues in this research uh, is that uh, when you look longitudinally, and, and this is what I think everyone should be doing, is, is measuring cognition uh, repeatedly over time, you see that there are big racial differences in intercept. And though we find, and these are actual data from YCAP, we find that uh, when you look at the difference, the, the linear change, um, it's a little bit depressing because everyone's memory goes down. So uh, if, if you haven't already noticed that, as you age, it is true, memory goes down. Uh, for everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, or education, it's, it's decreasing. And uh, what we find, though, is that the, 
if you, if you I, I tried to show you with these brackets what the initial intercept difference between blacks and whites uh, looks like at our later time point. There is a widening. Uh, these are the same people followed over time, not different people, so there's no survival bias here like I was showing you before. These are the same people, and there's, a, there's a, not just an intercept difference, but a slope difference related to race. But what's really impressive is that intercept difference. If, you know, maybe at the back of the room you can see uh, the slope difference, but it's kind of hard to see. Um, uh, it is much more, uh, it is much less, um, of, of a much lower magnitude than the intercept difference. So the question that I've been asking is, um, when do those differences uh, arise? If they're there when I start off following people at age 65, then, um, and, and the, the difference is getting wider, when really is that getting set up? And also, if I have any one diagnostic threshold, it's the intercept that matters more than the slope. So if I set a diagnostic threshold, say for dementia or even MCI at a certain point, the people who start off lower are gonna hit it sooner. So um, this uh, has, uh, I think, it, it's not only um, telling with respect to why it's important to collect longitudinal data, but also why it's important to examine uh, both intercept and slope and how those relate to any diagnostic threshold that you're setting for, for, um, for the clinical outcomes that we use. Okay, Carl, here's your figure from your paper that talked about the uh, NIA disparities research framework. And um, we can talk about later how we can make this figure better but because it's, it's right now basically a square with a bunch of other squares inside. But this things that the squares have inside are very important, showing that when you're looking at disparities, you need to take not just a life course approach, but also assess different domains of how these fundamental disparities factors get into health or, or affect health. And there are different levels of analysis. So we have, um, I think that's the other methodological challenge that I want to point out, which is that we have uh, a number of studies that have collected later life outcomes, cognitive outcomes across race, ethnicity, and, um, and some of the other disparities factors that are listed here. But what we don't have often is this comprehensive um, set of, of factors, and you don't need to do it all, but you you do need to touch on, I think, many of these factors, especially um, across the life course. And I'll show you why I think that's particularly important. Um, this is a figure from Jess Marden that's showing that even self or identified race has a cause prior to, the, prior to birth. Where you were born affects what race you are, or in a way is a determinant of what race you identify as as well as history and genetic ancestry. So even when we're talking about uh, uh, ancestry, uh, African ancestry, we have to think about the history of, of how that occurred in this country and why certain people have more or less African or more or less European ancestry. And a lot of those factors are social factors. So when we look at studies of African or European ancestry, genetic ancestry, um, Keep in mind that not only there is a, uh, I think a so, that those stand as proxies for social variables, but they were also caused by social factors. So um, I think the tendency is to think that when you look at genetic ancestry, it's biological, but I think that's not necessarily the case. We have to think carefully about how we're using those variables. So to start off with um, a, uh, with a discussion of biological, possible biological mediators or pathways through which race affects uh, Alzheimer's disease or later life cognitive function. The work of Adam Brickman has showed, shown that there's a greater burden of white matter hyperintensities among African Americans in the YCAP cohort and Hispanics in the YCAP cohort as compared to non-Hispanic whites. And again, you see this uh, this situation where, and here there really is no slope effect, there's no, uh, uh, there's no interaction between age and race on white matter hyperintensity burden. 
Um, and you're not born with white matter hyperintensities. They occur at some point during life. So when does that acceleration occur? When we start imaging at age 70, it's too late. So this suggests not only is it important to look at earlier uh, life, but that um, we need imaging earlier in life in order to, to um, uncover what some of the uh, causes and influences are on uh, development of, of um, neuropathology in the brain. In the YCAP study, uh, Laura Zahadny and Adam Brickman and others <clears throat> looked at the relationship of these white matter hyperintensities to cognition and found that they were related to cognitive outcomes among African Americans on the right, but unrelated to cognition in the whites. And conversely, hippocampal volume was a, uh, uh, below the sample mean, was related to risk of developing incident dementia in the whites, but not related to risk of developing incident dementia in the African Americans in the sample. So I'm pointing out these two slides to suggest that there may be different pathways to the clinical syndrome of Alzheimer's disease across race. Some may be more heavily involving amyloid tau, hippocampal volume, which is affected by those neuropathologies, and some may be more heavily weighted toward cerebrovascular disease. Um, and so we are just uh, beginning to get a better handle on this, but, but imaging, uh, uh, both um, uh, PET imaging and also uh, structural MRI imaging is needed to uh, determine this. So I mentioned admixture before. Tim Homan did a paper with a large group. I think the, the N was, um, if I'm remembering correctly, 9,000 African Americans who were Alzheimer's disease cases and matched controls. And he found that the percent of um, uh, African ancestry in the Alzheimer's disease cases was 80% and the percent uh, of African on average, and the average percent African ancestry in the controls was 79%. So that was significant because there were so many people in the study, but it's not really an impressive um, difference. But um, the conclusion was that um, at the whole ge genome level and at specific um, genetic loci like ABCA7, uh, African ancestry is associated with an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. And I just want to show some data to point out what I was saying before, that um, Jess Martin, um, uh, Stefan Walter, and um, Kaufman and Gleamore showed uh, in the health and retirement study was that in the, uh, in the African Americans with the highest quartile of African ancestry, it was associated with having less uh, education for the, for the respondent, fewer years of reported parental schooling, uh, less likely to have received an inheritance from their family, uh, lower income, and less wealth. So uh, it's, a, it's important to look at causal uh, pathways here. We don't think that ancestry in and of itself mediates biologically or, or influences these factors, but African ancestry is probably a really good marker for social experiences of the, each respondent, their parents, and their grandparents in terms of discrimination, segregation, and uh, socioeconomic uh, status. We also know that in a diabetes sample, uh, uh, accounting for socioeconomic status eliminated the association of European ancestry with lower risk um, of diabetes in uh, Colombia and uh, attenuated the association in Mexicans. So what are some of the other biological mechanisms that we are e evaluating? Uh, we're looking at epigenetic factors and uh, uh, RNA expression. Um, we may need um, different tissues in order to do that um, uh, accurately or with precision that then we have. Telomere shortening, um, Arlene Geronimus uh, has um, published uh, some data on that. It may, we may need to look at telomeres over time and not just cross-sectionally. 
and there may be a midlife critical period for uh, inflammation markers. So uh, all of these are challenges given the uh, older adult samples that we have. Let's talk about environmental mediators. And uh, one of the first things I did was um, I, uh, when, I, when I arrived at Columbia was I added a wordless learning task to the, um, to the battery, uh, both in Spanish, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a word recognition task, a word reading uh, task to, in Spanish and in English. And what I found was that first, um, adjusting for years of school, uh, illiterates had uh, lower um, scores on many measures than literates, even after adjusting for absolute years in school, and that reading level was a really good um, predictor of cognitive decline. Um, one of my students, um, uh, one of my fellows, Miguel Arce, is now um, preparing a manuscript that uh, looks at people in our cohort, these are all Spanish speakers, and they are all people with fewer than uh, uh, four years of school, zero, one, two, and three years of school, uh, and they're all immigrants, and uh, some of them are literate and some of them are illiterate. They're matched, essentially, on years of school. So uh, what we find is that the illiterates are at higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, as compared to the literates. And uh, however, there's this dilemma of the decline over time, which is that maybe our, uh, maybe our, because there are no differences in slope in memory over time, maybe our, our uh, 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 diagnostic threshold is what might explain the higher incidence. So um, again, just looking at incidence or Alzheimer's disease um, diagnosis isn't enough. You've got to look at, um, at change over time as well. Laura Zahadny asked the question, uh, what, whether income, adult income, was mediating the relationship between years of school and cognitive change. And she found that that was the case in people um, with high education or in our cohort above the median nine years of school. In people nine to 20 years of school, the effect of those each year of education was completely mediated by income. But in people with eight or fewer years of school, um, uh, the effect of early education was independent of income. So again, some of these mediating factors uh, might differ across um, uh, different educational levels, and the payoff to education may be different. Um, we've also been focusing on school quality, and what I want to point out is that years of school, or even a credential like a high school degree or a bachelor's degree, ignores tremendous variability in quality of school, and this is across race, geographic region, and also secular trends. And I was really inspired to look at this in the way that we're looking at it um, by Maria Gleamore, who found that in the health and retirement study, for people who were born just one year apart, some of them were affected by policy changes in each state, compulsory school law changes, um, and some were not because they were uh, one year older. Uh, the, the policy changes had a direct effect on later life cognitive function in the health and retirement study. So this is um, a great, uh, uh, example of how to use policy changes as a natural experiment and instrumental variable to look at the causal relationship between years of school and later life cognitive outcome. And what we found is that there's huge variability in the length of school year across race and across geographic location. So these data are um, on the length of school year um, by race and by state in, uh, in schools from 1919 all the way to 1951. Um, and so if you are an African American in South Carolina who went to school in the 1930s or 1940s, your school was open for half the time, essentially, as compared to whites in the same state or whites and blacks in the north. And student-teacher ratio as well, this is for elementary school. So black students in the south, segregated south, were sharing their classroom with 40 or 50 other kids. 
um, at the same time in, in elementary school compared to whites in the South or, um, or blacks and whites in the North. So uh, Sam Liu and our group um, looked at how these geographic disparities um, and racial and ge geographic disparities relate to later life cognitive function and other important um, outcomes like years of school. And so the width of this bar is the magnitude of the disparity of each bar is the magnitude of the disparity between blacks and whites who were born and raised in the west, south, midwest, and northeast, moving down for each of these uh, figures. And you can see that for memory, which is on the lower left side, the magnitude of the disparity is not that big, um, but it is wider in the south than any other, any other region. Whereas the magnitude of the disparity for vocabulary, which is on the lower right, is much bigger. So um, each cognitive domain has its own uh, separate relationship to these uh, variables, and um, the magnitude of disparities um, differs. Uh, as I said, we introduced a uh, reading level measure, the wide range achievement test. I'm giving you some examples of that here. If you know how to uh, pronounce that last word on the English side, anybody? Richard? Synecdoche. Okay, he learned something today. That's, that's all he wanted to do. Synecdoche, that you will have seen that word before and dealt with it before. It's a reflection of your reading level. And many people in uh, schools and uh, in, in the educational literature have used these kind of achievement measures to reflect school quality. So you may have graduated from high school, but you may be reading below a 12th grade level as compared to national um, normative groups. So that's really what this is getting at. The, all, the words get harder in terms of um, irregularity, and they get less frequent, like synecdoche. In Spanish, it's a little bit harder, because if you give a test like the one on the lower right, um, Spanish, um, each word or each letter has a sound, and that sound never changes. So it's not, there's, there's no irregularity in the sense that the phoneme, um, the, the, uh, the, the link between the orthography and the phonology is different. When there is a regularity, you've got an accent to guide your way. So if you uh, were to present a word list like the rat um, in Spanish, it doesn't work. And I found that out the hard way. Um, and I found a measure that was developed in Spain called the word accentuation test where words are all irregular and all infrequent and presented in capital letters without their accents. So it's getting at the same construct as the word, uh, as the wide range achievement test, but in another language. I showed this a little bit before. We find that word list, um, uh, that uh, reading level is um, predictive of your intercept in terms of delayed recall across race and also uh, predictive of your slope over time. So people with low reading level are, have a more rapid decline in memory. And this um, uh, interaction between time and reading level accounts for any inter interaction between race and time. Again, I'm going to show you the data from YCAP in a slightly different way. These, uh, this is a, um, a Cox regression plot for dementia incidence. Um, in the YCAP study, you can see that um, Hispanics and African Americans are at significantly higher risk for developing <laughs> dementia as compared to whites. <clears throat> and what we did was we uh, looked to see what would account for that um, racial difference. So this is just using white versus black. Um, uh, blacks are um, about 1.8 times more likely to develop in this cohort um, incident Alzheimer's disease compared to whites in that model one. Uh, in model two, we added um, some uh, medical variables, whether they had a stroke or not at baseline, and also uh, whether they had the E4 allele. You can see that the effect of race is not moved. I told you that in the beginning of the talk. Um, once you adjust for having low education, 
it's a significant predictor of who goes on to develop dementia, but it does not account for the race effect. It's not until you get at this um, reading level measure, which I'm using as a proxy for school quality, that you're able to explain the race difference. So what I'm saying is that um, uh, in these analyses, the, um, the disparities in developing Alzheimer's disease across race are accounted for by this proxy for school quality. If we were to measure the entire educational experience and not just years of education, we um, would be able to account for these disparities and explain them. And so I think that education is definitely, the full educational experience is in the pathway. Now, um, these, um, actually this is now um, published as of last week, this paper looking at the uh, secular changes. You've heard about some of those studies on Framingham and the health and retirement study that have been showing some decreases in incidence in dementia as time goes on. So these are data from the YCAP study. As I told you, there are three different cohorts, one recruited in 1992 and one in 99. And an important thing for you to look at is the average years of education in each cohort. In 92, the average years of school in the cohort was 8.7 years, and in 99, it's 10.6 years. And that is almost entirely explained by an increase in education in the African Americans in that sample. And it is almost entirely due to those compulsory school law changes that um, I talked about before that took place in the years that these folks were attending school in the South. So what we find is that indeed there was a decrease in incident Alzheimer's disease in the 99 cohort as compared to the 92 cohort. Uh, and they were recruited, I should have said, essentially in the same way. And we had made a number of adjustments for variables that reviewers told us <laughs> that we needed to adjust for because they were worried about it before um, making this conclusion. And what I'm showing you here is that that decline in um, incidence was fully explained by years of education among the African Americans, but did, did not explain the decline in incidence in the Hispanic groups. There wasn't much of a decline in education, or an increase in education in Hispanics, but um, the other thing for you to uh, read into in the slide is that um, uh, Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease went up uh, from 92 to 99. It, the prevalence got higher. Uh, and that increase in prevalence actually did, in the whites, explain uh, a, a, par, a decrease in prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. So I think there's an interaction between treatment and uh, better treatment for these conditions and a higher prevalence of, of these conditions that's complicated. But what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, education explained this decline in, or increases in education explain this secular change in, um, in uh, rates of Alzheimer's disease. So I talked with, uh, with Richard Hodes earlier um, this week about bilingualism, and I just wanted to show you quickly some of the results that we have there. There's a number of studies now that suggest that bilingualism is protective against cognitive impairment and um, Alzheimer's disease, and they're largely coming from um, Ellen Bialystok and her colleagues, uh, but there are others too. Um, the, the one thing I want to point out is that selection bias is a huge issue in these studies as well. So where these bilinguals are coming from and how they were recruited and how, they're, uh, how they compare to the monolinguals in the study really matters. And what we were able to do in YCAP was to um, look uh, at some of the factors that may travel along with bilingualism, um, but, but not bilingualism itself, um, like years in the US, like, uh, like education, um, uh, and other socioeconomic variables that may, be, it, it may explain the effect of bilingualism on cognitive function. But the idea is that the continuous task of, or the hypothesis is that it, the task of managing uh, competing languages imparts um, reserve or resilience to neuropathology. Um, this is a little bit small, but what I can show you is in that, uh, in uh, figure A, 
that is the effective age on risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in the in immigrant, all Spanish speaking uh, immigrant people, or they were all tested in Spanish in our um, in our uh, evaluation. But they have varying levels of English ability in our cohort. So while um, uh, all of them were tested in Spanish, we looked at the effect of their English ability, which was uh, v uh, validated by giving them that English uh, word reading test. Uh, and so the effective age in figure A is quite impressive. Um, people who are older are much more likely to develop uh, Alzheimer's disease than people who are younger. But the effect of bilingualism is in figure D. You can see there's barely any separation between these four levels of um, English fluency uh, among the Spanish speakers. So what we found was that there was no um, lasting effect of um, bilingualism uh, on uh, risk of developing Alzheimer's disease after adjusting for these other factors. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with um, the knowledge that there are racial and ethnic disparities in, in Alzheimer's disease and cognitive aging, that these are not attributable solely to assessment bias, but if you do a prevalence sample or if you're looking um, cross-sectionally, that is a major factor and you need proper norms, local norms to um, handle that. The independent effective race on cognitive function is uh, larger on intercept than on slope, but there, uh, we do find uh, that African Americans have a more rapid decline than whites. Differences across studies may be attributable to uh, recruitment, selection, and survival bias. So essentially, clinic-based cohorts are not appropriate for disparities research in Alzheimer's disease. You need representative cohorts either of a neighborhood or uh, nationally representative cohorts. There are biological, environmental, and sociocultural mediators of disparities that we have examined. Uh, we've found that indicators of school quality explain racial disparities in cognitive function, and that the declining trend of dementia incidence among African Americans appears to be explained by secular in increases primarily caused by compulsory school law changes in years of school. And what we need are more studies that are uh, uh, looking to elucidate causal mechanisms for um, these, these disparities. I think these studies need to be longitudinal, measure, measure a full uh, com uh, component of educational experience, not just years attended, and also burden of neuropathology. Taking a life course perspective is incredibly important in this research, and we have the opportunity to look at some of these natural experiments if we tag on to uh, planned interventions on uh, socioeconomic and neighborhood uh, and, other, um, and other interventions. I wanna quickly tell you about three new studies <clears throat> that I'm involved in. Uh, we are recruiting now the offspring of the YCAP cohorts, so they are in midlife. And uh, we are designing our study so that we're using parental Alzheimer's disease uh, status as a factor in recruiting, uh, in um, uh, comparing the offspring, whether they have a, a family history um, of Alzheimer's disease or not, and also when the date of onset. So we've been following their parents over time. We know uh, their date of onset of Alzheimer's disease and looking to see if this midlife cohort um, with known parental AD status can help us reveal some mechanisms for racial disparities in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'll talk about Project Talent in a minute, but, um, and also in also regards. Project Talent took place in 1960. There were um, almost 400,000 ninth through 12th graders who were assessed, including um, uh, segregated black schools and we are finding those people, here are the schools that um, took part in Project Talent across the country. We're finding those people who are now in their 70s and um, using the data that was collected in 1960 to help us determine uh, what about schools 
Was it uh, your peers? Is it the quality of school? Was it the neighborhood that there was school in? Uh, that the school was in? What about education and the quality of education is uh, promoting resilience uh, for people across race and whether, the, whether that's moderated by race. Regards is the reason for geographic and racial differences in stroke. It has a um, VCID component in its newest um, version. There are a ton of people who participated in Regards and here they are. They were all administered a cognitive uh, battery over the phone and I'm really proud to be the co-PI of that study moving forward with George Howard. Um, and what we've done, because um, Ginny Howard, his, uh, uh, they're related, Ginny and George Howard, um, uh, uh, she has a um, ancillary study in which she asked for every school that people attended and every place that they lived throughout their entire life. So as you can imagine, asking older adults to do that is challenging. But once she got the data, we were able to, Maria Gleemore um, headed up this effort, but we were able to um, look at the older uh, school data. I showed you a little bit of that at the state level before, but now you can get it at the county level. So this is a state biennial report, um, that, and you can see the data that's there for um, attendance for whites and it says there on the slide and on, in the book for Negro schools in 1957. So you take that, um, you take those data uh, and you uh, uh, can relate them <clears throat> to later life outcomes. This is a, in Mississippi, uh, part of a report on education for black children, there was a cow judging contest. Since daring should occupy such a prominent place in Mississippi, um, and in view of the fact that only a small percentage of the Negro children attend school beyond the elementary grades, it thought something should be done to encourage them to give more serious thought, it says though, thought to cattle raising. And the winner of the cattle contest is Eddie Battle, um, a, a young African-American boy. And I, I'm gonna find Eddie Battle somewhere. He was 12 years old. Um, and we'll find out what happened to him. His prize was a superior registered Jersey heifer. Um, and this, uh, these data it was pulled from a Mississippi uh, book, uh, again, a, a report just uh, pointing out the difference between number of uh, days uh, of, that the school was open versus average daily attendance, which was much lower. So that's another um, big variable. But what, um, what we found was that, was that when, when trying to test the historical investments um, in, in school quality and how that related to later life cognition, at the county level, in regards, there, uh, this education gradient, um, or relationship of years of education to health outcomes, this happened to be uh, a screening, a cognitive screening test, the six item screener, was uh, the, the, the returns to years of school was greater if your term length was longer at the county level. So that makes sense. You're attending school for more uh, days. And so th this is the power that you have with a national cohort like Regards. Thank you. If you'll go to the microphone, please. And I'm going to um, take the prerogative of starting off and asking. Um, you made some comments early on about the new research framework for Alzheimer's disease that's being proposed. Um, the objective is to have biological markers that will allow the identification of um, subjects who uh, may be on the way to developing Alzheimer's disease before they have symptomatology. And, you clearly made the point that selection bias may mean that the biomarkers that are being focused upon are not representative of the full population. So if you had the opportunity to add things to that, what would you recommend be added to make it uh, a more usable and more generalizable instrument? Well, I think first um, what I would do is uh, if we want to, if we want, if we want to identify people who are at higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, 
I think it would add some um, some social and uh, and environmental and educational variables to the, to the mix. And uh, I would also add cognitive testing data. Research has shown that even if you are amyloid positive, if you have um, cognitive test data, your prediction of later um, development of Alzheimer's disease is much better if you, if you uh, incorporate the cognitive data um, fully into your, into your prediction model. The, the other uh, thing that I would add is just data on ethnic minorities, which they don't have. Um, and so I'm not comfortable with um, the conclusion that these uh, proteins uh, put uh, people at higher risk at the same rate or at the same degree uh, across different uh, experiences and backgrounds that affect, as we know, uh, just have a whole life course effect on, on the biology of, of the brain. So um, I think those are the two things that I would add. I think ultimately we will get to the point where we have some really great biomarkers, but I think what the problem with the framework is that it confuses risk factor with disease. Amyloid and tau are risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, the clinical syndrome of Alzheimer's disease. They are not themselves Alzheimer's disease. So I think that's my, my biggest issue, one of my biggest issues. Yes? So following up on that, you said that there might be two different mechanisms, one which is the tau amyloid base and the other which is uh, cerebrovascular disease. Which do you think is more affected by education? I don't know. I do not know that yet, and that's a great question. Um, uh, the, the reason why I don't know is that we don't have, right now, enough amyloid and tau imaging in people uh, in diverse cohorts to be able to answer that question. That's Thank something you. we're hoping to get to. Thank you. Sure. Yes. In your beginning, you mentioned that it was mainly Caribbean Hispanics that you found in your cohort. This is interesting because Mexican, Central American, and South American, I would think there would be a large number of them, and they would be far more interesting than Caribbean because they have a, a far stronger cultural infrastructure. The Caribbean are tiny countries that are mainly satellites of something else. But when you get to some place like Mexico, they have a, a, a very, very detailed super culture. And Central America and South American countries tend to have a little bit less. But I would be very interested to hear how they would compare with Mexican Americans who have an incredibly sophisticated infrastructure, culture, and family support systems. I agree with you that Mexicans and Mexican Americans have a, a great uh, you know, structure and infrastructure. but. But I don't think you, you should say that in Washington Heights um, because that's where a lot of Caribbean Hispanics um, live and I think they would disagree with you uh, that there's no infrastructure in that community. It's actually a really strong and thriving uh, community. Puerto Ricans have been there for quite some time in New York City. Cuban Americans have a strong infrastructure in New York City and other places in the United States and the Dominicans um, in terms of, 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 uh, of training physicians, even at the medical center that I work at, in terms of uh, political, uh, you know, on, in, in the House of Representatives and other political um, offices in, in the Washington Heights, uh, Dominicans are, are thriving. So I think that it is now just to, to take the, the uh, idea of your question further, I think that there are some really important cultural, linguistic, immigration, uh, reasons for immigration, uh, socioeconomic differences uh, that, that are going to make a huge impact on some of the health outcomes and aging outcomes among those different uh, cohorts. And that's where the soul study for, as an example, is a really great, um, a really great cohort because you're able to compare uh, across these different um, nationalities within Latinos and Hispanics to get more at what you're talking about. Thank you. Both country, I've worked in Puerto Rico and I've worked in Mexico, so 
that's the reason I'm, I'm saying that. I've observed the difference in the infrastructure. But thank you. Thank you. Could, could you talk more about your plans for project talent for that analysis? It, uh, uh, it's a really interesting cohort, and, and you indicated the, the great geographic spread. But what, what kind of things do you think you can do with that that aren't available in, right. in other data sets? So one of the things you can do, and why I'm so interested in project talent, is that they, uh, in, when they selected a school, they tested everyone in each school. So um, I'm able to look at the uh, uh, individual within schools. And uh, there could be different individual trajectories depending on the peer group that they had in that school. Um, they also collected a lot of data about the school at the time that Project Talent took place in 1960. So instead of looking at just these historical data um, at the county level, which are helpful, uh, I can get information from the administrators and the principals who filled out um, questionnaires about their teachers, the level of teacher training, the kind of classes that were available. We even have yearbooks where uh, people have looked at yearbooks to, uh, and, and yearbook pictures to look at the level of integration within mixed race schools. Were the cl did the clubs include both blacks and whites? How did the sports teams look? Um, uh, so that are, especially in the integrated schools, we can look at uh, whether those, those integrated schools, who those were beneficial to, most beneficial to, were they black students, were they white students, did region matter for that, and did your peer group matter for that. We also uh, know that those integrated schools, um, uh, you know, occurred in different, in different settings. Were they newly integrated, or had they been integrated for a while? Um, so again, um, just focusing on what about school um, imparts these later life effects. I, I, I'll have the opportunity to do that. And the other important thing is that cognition was measured on each person in Project Talent. They did it in a different way than I would do it now. They did it in paper and pencil tests, but those um, cognitive instruments have been factor analyzed and looked at in a number of studies over the years. And so what I have now is a starting point when they were uh, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And that starting point I can adjust for it when I'm looking at their later life cognitive function. So I can look at trajectory over time. Maybe they were always uh, relatively low compared to their peers. Maybe their cognition was relatively low. Um, or was there a significant decline um, compared to people like them um, uh, over time. So again, it's getting at that intercept versus slope difference that's so important across race. Thank you. We unfortunately are gonna have to wrap up soon, so with the last two questions, if we can make them brief and brief yeah. responses. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I will try. Yeah. And we're <laughs> having a reception afterwards, so if you have more questions, I'll, I'm, I'll be there. Hi, thank you for your talk. I was wondering if your research points to some interventions that could take place later in life. If some of the early life experiences with education make such an impact, what can be done for someone who maybe has reached middle age and perhaps they're illiterate or otherwise had a low school quality? So do you want to go and, and do this study with me? Come and do this study with me because what we should do is a literacy intervention um, among people of low literacy. and. Um, I know that there have been a number of uh, interventions like the active study. They recruited well-educated people. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reading level. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know if there's a critical period for literacy, but uh, we, should, we, should, we should write this grant at the next um, deadline. Okay. I know okay. you're into it. That sounds good. I am. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thanks for your talk, Dr. Manley. Uh, Thanks for mentioning the NIA health disparities. Did I research. say NIH? I'm it, sorry. It, yeah, NIA health disparities yeah, NIA. Uh, frame, framework. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So, you know, you had some really good discussion about recruitment and retention of um, diverse populations. It sounds as if at least one of these populations, African Americans, are disproportionately affected in YCAP and in another study in California. but least likely to be recruited or retained in this research. So what are, what are your general thoughts about um, 
recruitment and retention. And, and you know, just kind of some speculations you have for, for really uh, improving that, 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 that disparities. I think it's a, it's a real um, issue that leads to health disparities research is very important. Yeah. In one minute or less. In one minute or less. Uh, community-based participatory research, uh, four words, and I think that um, from the very beginning we need to partner with the communities that we're hoping to uh, recruit to help them shape and influence the research and to engage them in, in the research. I think that we also need to be engaged. Researchers need to be um, uh, taught by the community about what uh, are the priorities and how they wish to um, take part in, in that research. And those partnerships um, are very successful. And if they are taken seriously with equal, with an equal uh, uh, focus on equal in, input and equal in, uh, uh, impact, those are, uh, can be very successful. But in the meantime, door to door, uh, uh, telephone, uh, home visits, um, uh, representative cohorts, that's, I think, uh, leveraging those cohorts that already exist that are representative um, nationally are, are, is going to be very important. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Manley again.